Katie Niemeyer. I live in Austin, Texas, and at age 16, I had a reaction to a medication called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis. With Stevens-Johnson syndrome, basically you have a very severe reaction to a medication with an overreaction of your own autoimmune system. So what happens is protein markers go rogue and they see your skin and your mucous membranes as not your own, attacking them, causing them to blister and burn as if you had been in a fire. I spent three weeks in a burn unit with second degree burns from head to toe. My parents were told the chances of me surviving were slim and if I lived, I'd most likely be left blind. There are different levels of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Like I said in the beginning, I named it Stevens-Johnson syndrome toxic epidermal necrolysis. If you have a more severe, it's the top toxic epidermal necrolysis. If you have less severe, it's more of the SJS. So some people don't ever even need to be in the burn unit. It's, it's kind of um, more of a rash and blisters. And then some people literally die from this because like I said, it occurs on the inside just as much as it burns your skin on the outside. So your lungs, your um, GI system, everything's affected and those mucous membranes can burst or get infected and it can kill you. So it really can be from any medication, but there are more common ones. Your antibiotics, like your sulfa drugs, your anti-seizure medicines, your antidepressants, and actually allopurinol for gout is the number one medicine that causes Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So there's very little research that's been done over the 30 years since I've had this, but they have identified a gene and almost eliminated Stevens-Johnson syndrome in certain parts of the world because they've identified that gene and test for it prior to prescribing some of the high-risk medicines. But I don't have that gene, so there's obviously other ways that you can get this medicine. It's not a specific genetic thing. Also, there is a skin biopsy that they've started to do that can help diagnose it early on. If you are prescribed one of those high-risk medicines, so your anti-seizures, your antidepressants, your NSAIDs, your non-steroidals, and you start to have flu-like symptoms, it's most likely it's not Stevens-Johnson syndrome, but it should be on your radar. And what I tell physicians is just like you go to the ER with chest pain, you may not be having a heart attack, but I guarantee you we're going to run a buttload of tests to rule out that it isn't an MI before we let you go home. So we should have some sort of, with technology today, we should have systems set up globally that if you are on one of these high-risk medicines and you start to have the normal flu-like symptoms, that when you plug that into your charting, that a red flag should shoot up so that it's on your radar to be thinking about Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Because what's very important to know is that we have things, it may not be able to stop it from occurring, but we can regulate the long-term effects. So like the corneas get scarred and patients end up blind. Well, we have a lining now that we can put on those. If we test, if we figure out it's SJS early enough, that we put on those to prevent this, the corneas from being scarred to preserve your eyesight. That's huge. But if we misdiagnose it and, and miss that window of opportunity, then it's unfortunate that these things still occur. It's around two to three per million in this country alone. But the problem is it's probably a lot higher because it is so often misdiagnosed and it's not net mandatory to submit it to a registry. So they don't really have a way to track it yet. So I not only share my story of the three weeks in the burn unit with SJS to raise awareness and funds for research, but I also share a story of the power of one. While I was in the burn unit, there was a man, a fireman. His name was Carrie. He was in the room next to mine. He had to jump from a burning building because he caught fire. I was wrapped like a mummy. I couldn't see, I couldn't talk, I couldn't move. I was in so much pain. But I could hear every day Carrie would pass my room to check on me. I'd hear his voice saying, hey Katie, how you doing? Well, Carrie and I stayed in touch after we both got out of the burn unit. He came to my dance recital later that year, my high school graduation, my college graduation, and even attended my wedding. But Carrie and I lost touch when I left St. Louis and moved to Austin, Texas. It had been probably like 15 years since I'd spoken with him. 
I had the opportunity to reach out to a national talk show, The Steve Harvey Show. They brought Kerry on the show. He thought he'd be talking about his days as a fireman, and I was able to surprise him and thank him for the difference he made, a complete stranger in the midst of his own turmoil, and what that communicated to me. He didn't know that I had been in the burn unit because of a reaction to a medication. He didn't know that just weeks prior, the medicine I had taken was an antidepressant after an attempted suicide attempt. But because of a complete stranger who just stopped and said, how are you doing, Katie? He showed me my life had value. And I went on to become a nurse, a mother of two, an entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. All because of one man. We all have a story. And whether your story is an epic to celebrate or a tragedy to mourn, depends less what happened to you and more on what you do with it. So if you need that reminder today, just know that there's hope out there for all of us, no matter what our story is. And you can learn more about me at katiemeemeyer.com.